and see what we did the last time. So I think we, we ended up here last time. So we're looking at the uh, conservation of mechanical energy, and uh, we're at this expression for the conservation of the uh, mechanical energy, which is equal to the rate of work done by the surface stresses plus compression or expansion of volume minus any rate of viscous dissipation, which has two terms, that phi, and that phi was proportional to the viscosity. Okay, so we're going to finish with the um, mechanical energy conservation, so we're going to derive a couple more um, ways of looking at the um, uh, integral form of the conservation of energy and we'll see a couple more terms that are interesting and then we'll look at the uh, thermal energy equation through the uh, first law of thermodynamics and then an application of the conservation of energy which is very useful which is the Bernoulli equation okay? the Bernoulli equation is used in many uh, hydrodynamics problems from engineering problems to, to geophysical fluid dynamics problems as well So now we're going to look at another form of conservation of mechanical energy where a new term will arise, which is the divergence of kinetic energy flux. Don't expect a great performance today because I don't feel well. Okay, so if you remember what we did to arrive to the uh, conservation of mechanical energy, we took the Euler equation, right? Now what we can do is use the continuity equation. So what we're going to do is multiply the continuity equation times what we call our kinetic energy. Okay. So if we do this the continuity equation okay so instead of taking the other equation and multiply that by u we're going to take the continuity equation and multiply that by the kinetic energy you can rewrite this in different form Now we add this, this is, this is just the continuity equation times the, the kinetic energy. Now we can add this to the uh, energy equation that we derived previously. That was this, the body forces plus Okay, 
that was the uh, conservation of mechanical energy that we derived before. So now we take the continuity equation times the uh, kinetic energy and we add that together. So what we get, so now it's the continuity equation. same form of conservation of mechanical energy, but what we did is taking the continuity equation and adding that to the mechanical energy equation. And what we see now is that we have this term, which is a divergence of a kinetic energy flux. Okay? And that is very useful when you do budgets or balances in your volume of integration. Okay? So, if you want to look at the conservation of energy within a certain volume over which you're integrating, it could be a material volume or a fixed volume, then there might be an energy flux and there might be a divergence in your energy flux. So you want to see what is happening to the energy within your volume of integration. So imagine the right hand side is equal to zero, so there are no body forces and there are no work done by stresses or the two cancel each other. So this means that your energy increases if the divergence is, is negative. Right? So if you have an energy flux into your volume of integration then your energy increases in time. So this energy flux of kinetic energy it's also called transport, the transport term. Because basically what it's doing is redistributing energy as long as your volume over which you are considering your fluid is large enough. Then this divergence of energy flux is just redistributing energy from one place to the other, okay? but it's not adding any net energy. <coughs> because, so basically, you want to say if over a column in your fluid there's an energy flux, there must be a, there might be an energy flux which you can call a transport. Okay, so if you remember the uh, the example we were doing of the uh, column, column of water over which we were integrating the continuity equation and then we ended up with the shallow water equations. Okay? So within this column over which you are checking your energy budget, we have a term which is this divergence of the energy flux, okay? which is also called a transport because it's basically an energy flux of energy entering and exiting, exiting the, uh, the column, but the total energy is conserved in the system. Okay, so if you have a model, for example, of the ocean or the atmosphere, you want the energy to be conserved everywhere. But then if you look at some particular place, 
you have an energy flux. You might have an energy flux and a divergence of energy. Okay? But this energy flux is not a net, a net uh, input or outflow of energy. It's just a redistributing of energy between one place of the domain and another place of the domain. Okay? So for your particular column fluid, it's just a transport of energy passing through, okay? which is redistributing the energy. If you if you integrate this divergence of kinetic energy flux over the total volume of the atmosphere or the ocean or whatever through Gauss, this is equal to zero. as long as there are no fluxes of energy on the boundaries of your domain. Right? So the total volume integral of this transport term is equal to the energy flux on the area bounding the volume of integration, which if you don't have any source of sinks in your quiet system or atmosphere or ocean, that is equal to zero. Okay? So this means that this term integrated over the whole volume is equal to zero, meaning that this term is just a redistribution of energy flux within the system. Okay? It's not adding any net energy to the system. Those are provided by, by the, the different terms on the right hand side. Okay. So We're going to look at the final and last promise way of looking at the uh, conservation of mechanical energy for an integral form. Okay, so we take the expression we just used. as we saw previously. So there are two flux divergences. You see that multiplied by u. So there are two flux divergences. And so we can write these two equations as we just did. Okay, 
is using Gauss. So now we substitute that and we integrate over a fixed volume for convenience and we get an integral form of the conservation of mechanical energy. forces are acting on the boundaries of the surfaces, plus any term due to compression or expansion. budget for your volume of integration, for your volume over which you are, for example, numerically integrating, okay, and you want to make sure that you're conserving energy, otherwise you have a problem, then the rate of change of your energy in the system plus any rate of outflow of the energy across the boundaries, if you have any, that's going to be equal to the rate of work done by the body forces over the volume plus the rate of work done by the surface forces at the boundaries okay, on the surfaces plus the rate of work done by the volume expansion or compression of the volume of integration minus any rate of work done by viscous dissipation. So this is a typical exam question. Okay? The exam question is the equation. Okay? And the question is <coughs> explain physically every term, what do they mean? And What are the balances and why why there is a minus here, why there is a plus here, right? Why is this integrated over an area and why is this integrated over a volume? Okay. 
the exam question is, going, is not going to be about take the continuity equation and then derive the conservation of total energy uh, over a volume because that's just doing it. It's not very interesting. But the interesting part is understanding what every term means. So now we can look at the uh, thermal energy equation, which so if you notice, we've derived the conservation of energy either from the Euler equation, so the conservation of momentum, or from the continuity equation. So there were both. In both cases, it, it was a derived quantity from a different conservation principle. So we could actually do it by taking the first law of thermodynamics and start from there. So we need an independent equation for temperature, and that is going to come from the first law of thermodynamics. So you can define Q as a heat flux vector. And E is going to be the internal energy per unit mass. Surface uh, are just a mere derivation from, 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 from the valve field and up here, from the volume in the field. Now, what explanation would it be? Is it because the surface forces while integrate over an area? Sorry, what is the question? The divergence term? I mean, when you, you, put, up, you put up the long equation, mm -hmm. you said a typical example equation would be like, why do we integral of an area. But yes. One realizes that from above, area integral can go back to the volume integral. Sure. And then, what would actually be the answer now? Is it because I the surface process? Why, why do you look at the, uh, the integral over a volume for a body force? And why do you look at the uh, area integral for a surface, surface force? Because the body force is acting over the volume. Whereas the surface forces are acting over a surface, they're tangential forces. And so they're acting over a force, over, over a surface. Okay. So you, you could just put every, every term back into volume intervals, of course, okay? Just through Gauss you can go back and forth. But it is more interesting to look at that final equation as an equation where some terms are volume intervals for the body force, and some terms are air intervals because they're related to the surface forces acting over a surface. Okay. So if you remember, the, you, had, you had this this term, that was the surface surface force. So this is a surface force over a dA and is acting in the I direction. So this is a force in the This 
is a force in the I direction, normal to the uh, di. So you want to know what is the net rate of work done by this surface force over an area. Whereas the body forces are acting over the volume. So it's more interesting and more useful to look at the integrated over the volume because that's what they do. You could you could just take this term back to your volume integral. Yes, the counts. But physically it is more interesting to put it as an area integral because it gives you better the idea of what the surface stress is doing over an area and the fact that it's acting over a surface whereas the body force is acting over a volume. But, um, from, for example, when, when you, are, you are proving that the divergence of a car is equal to zero, we actually the fact that take it to the, to the line integral. Um, what we did last time was the d phi equals to zero. Like we just look at a change in a different like line, like like, like line integral of uh, of 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 a, of a given like space. So why then do we have to alternate between the volume, the area, and the line integral? No, the question is. Uh, if it is really interesting to to look at it in terms of area, why then do we have to, 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 to labor hard to take it to for example the line into? You don't have to learn by heart anything. <laughs> Biologists learn by heart. I mean, why okay, why do we have to? Why then do we have to transform a, line, a surface into a line into? Through stocks. Yeah. When they, well, we did that many times, but I don't remember, I don't know what you mean. Sometimes it is useful to, to, it is useful to, to use the stocks theorem to go from a surface integral to a line integral. We use that for the vorticity, for example. But the, 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 the just theorem, the just theorems that are useful to manipulate all your divergence or curl and going and then for example if you have an equation an equation and uh, you want to change a, a volume integral to a line um, um, a surface integral and then you put it on the left hand side and you include it into the Lagrangian derivative for example it's just playing around with terms that, that it doesn't change the physical meaning of the term okay? so you just use Gauss or stocks to go from one expression to the other, but physically it means the same. But it just allows you to, to write the term in a different way so that then you can manipulate the term and then play around with the term. But it doesn't change the physical meaning of the term. So the long equation, you could have written the work done by the surface stresses as a volume integral, which is fine, but it's a divergence term, so you can actually put it as a surface integral because it's a divergence term. And so that makes you realize that it's a surface force acting over a surface. You could use the volume integral and then put every term into the same volume integration or do whatever you like. I mean, it's just changing the color of a term so that you can see more clearly what they are doing physically. But mathematically, they're equivalent. You're just using Gauss to go from one expression to I can add one thing about this. That both Gauss and Stokes theorems are just the same, uh, more generally, application of a mathematical uh, operation. Because the differential of a tensor or a differential form, something like that. Yes, they, they have the same root. The, the Gauss theorem is in three dimension, or the other is in yes. two dimensions. Yeah. yeah, so. Gauss is more general than the stocks one, yes. So mathematically they are the same thing with that. That Gauss for a vector is the divergence term and, and then... <coughs> so that's the answer. So now we can use Q 
as an influx, the vector. And E is going to be our internal energy per unit mass. Okay. So we're going to look at the first law of thermodynamics. So for a perfect gas, I've already done this in thermodynamics, E is the specific heat times the temperature. And now you can define stored energy. E plus the kinetic energy. Okay, so now we are also including the internal energy into the system. So the first law of thermodynamics basically says that the rate of change of stored energy is equal to the total work done on the uh, element plus any heat addition or subtraction to the material body, so that the Q of that. So you can express that as over a volume per unit mass. This is the stored energy. It's going to be equal to forces and surface forces minus any rate of heat up Okay, so this is a way of writing the first law of thermodynamics. The rate of change of the stored energy is equal to the total rate of work rate of work by the body and the surface forces. You see we have a volume integral here and a surface integral there. Minus any possible rate of heat outflow and there's a minus because it's acting on the same a. Okay. So that means out of the volume of integration. So that's heat lost from the volume of integration. Lagrangian derivative into the uh, volume integral, and we're going to have to use the Leibniz theorem. Okay, so we're going to apply the Leibniz theorem to the left hand side of this equation. So if you remember. The rate of change of a volume integral is equal to the rate of change of f integrated over the volume plus the flux of the boundaries. Okay, that was the uh, <coughs> the Latin theorem. So now, if you derivative, you have this, which is 
the same as So now we can define a function f, which is rho times some function, small f. So the d by dt of rho f dv, okay, so that rate of change of the volume integral is going to be equal to this. Once you expand all the times. But we know continuity and we know that those two terms are equal to zero. It's because of continuity. So we are left with rho d by dt of f. Plus rho u i, the advector. Okay, so we have the time, we are left with the time derivative and the advector part, which means. side as the volume integral of the Lagrangian derivative because of Leibniz. So the volume integral of the stored energy 
or the rate of change of the stored energy is equal to all the volume integral of the rate of work done by the body forces and the surface forces minus any heat outflux from the volume. If you want a heat equation, you can subtract the mechanical energy okay. so you just subtract the mechanical energy part from this stored energy and you're left with the internal energy component So basically it's saying that your internal energy increases if there is a convergence okay, or compression. So divergence is negative, so this is a plus. So your internal energy increases if there is a convergence or volume compression. And then if there is viscous dissipation, then your internal energy increases. So remember that this, this was a minus for the mechanical energy equation. So viscous dissipation removes energy from kinetic energy and adds energy to the internal energy, okay? which is to the heat equation. So basically, through viscous dissipation, you reduce kinetic energy and you put that energy into heat. Okay? And that's because that's from this side. Okay. So viscous dissipation, they remove energy from kinetic energy from kinetic, and they transform it as as heat. say for the uh, for the energy equation so we derive the conservation of energy either from the oil equation so momentum or from the uh, continuity equation so it wasn't a separate it wasn't a separate principle so this time we use the first law of thermodynamics and we arrived to the uh, heat equation So this is your thermal energy equation. So internal energy, E, can increase because of convergence of heat. That's the first term, this one. So you have a divergence. If you have a convergence, that is going to be an increase in your internal energy. Volume compression, which is this other term. And viscous dissipation, which increases your internal energy as well. So, convergence of heat, compression, 
and viscosity, viscous dissipation, which removes kinetic energy from the system and adds it in the form of heat. Sorry, mm -hmm. compression as it increases or decreases the internal energy? Sorry? The compression term. Compression body it should increase the internal energy. It does, yes. So if the divergence term is is negative, that's a plus. Okay, I see. Okay. So again, this is another typical exam question. Okay, you get the uh, you get the um, for example, you get the first law of thermodynamics, and you get the uh, mechanical energy equation. And I say, show just the thermal equation and the meaning of each term, and why there's a plus here and why there's a minus there. What does it mean physically? What happens with compression? What happens with uh, uh, divergence of heat and so on? Okay? So just explain physically which, what each term means and what is the difference between between one expression and the other not deriving the expression yeah. you don't seem convinced I like your expressions because you're always like this doesn't make sense to me what is it? <coughs> say it no, you don't want to say it so what is not fine? Everything is fine. Great. Thank you. We have time, we can have a two minutes break. So because I have to rest my voice. So I'm gonna show you something nice. So you don't get too bored. If I can find it. Okay, so you remember when when we were looking at the uh, well, we look for the conservation of <coughs> conservation of um, mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. Okay, from first principles, it's easy. Sometimes it's boring. It's it's always it's always the same things that you probably have seen already. But it's the basis to it's the basis of everything we do, especially numerically. Right? We do a lot of numerical modeling, and our models need to conserve mass, momentum and energy, otherwise we have a problem. So if you if if you were at the uh, seminar yesterday, so Franco comes from a center that is called ECNWF, so European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. So when you do when you do um, weather forecasting for one, two days, seven days, maximum two weeks, okay? You're not too concerned about conservation principles because your model doesn't need to be running for years or centuries when your budget needs to be closed. Okay? So if you're running just for 10 days, even if you're not totally conserving energy, it's fine. For 10 days, it's fine. Okay? You, you prefer to have a model that is not conserving energy, but a model that is very good at predicting weather. For in some other ways, okay. The problem is when you use those models to then do climatic um, integrations, which are a thousand, five thousand years long. So if you're not conserving water, mass, volume, energy, or momentum, okay, after five thousand years, you're gonna have a lot of problems. Okay, even 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 though that error is very small, after five thousand years, that error grows a lot. So you need to be, every, every time you, you use the models that we use, every X time step, we check conservation principles. 
So we check that over the grid box, we conserve energy, we conserve mass or volume, depending on the model, and we conserve momentum. Okay? And we conserve traces as well. Okay? So we do all those checks to see that we don't have any leak in energy, for example. Okay? And that's because we want to produce nice models like the one that I'm going to show you, okay? which are the models that use the full complex Navier-Stokes equations uh, with Buzinex approximation, uh, hydrostatic, okay? So there are some approximations in the equation, but it's basically the full, the full equation of motions with all different terms that you might think of. But all the things that we looked at in this class, all those conservation principles and so on, they're checked at every, well, maybe not at every time step, but very regularly in these models, okay? Because they're important. So this is a nice video of a couple model. So this model is has an ocean model, an atmosphere model, sea ice model, and a land model. Okay, and it's run for uh, five hundred years or something like that. Okay, and it's particularly high resolution in in the ocean. So if you remember from yesterday's talk. Franco was using a model that in the atmosphere is something like 36 kilometers, okay? which is high resolution for the atmosphere, but it's not fantastic. I mean, it's not super, super high resolution. It's, it's good. In the ocean, it's, you know, it's amazing. Okay? In the ocean, usually we use a one degree model, which is 100 and something kilometers. And in the last few years, we've gone down to a quarter degree, so 25, 30 kilometers. And this model is one tenth of a degree, so which is you know, twelve kilometers or so, depending on depending on where depending on the latitude. So this is really high high resolution in the ocean, and when you have very high resolution in the ocean, you can get rid of some of the parameterizations that we use in the ocean, especially for the eddy fluxes of traces and momentum, okay, which are parameterized, and parameterizations are never perfect. So this model doesn't use parameterizations for eddy fluxes, which are resolved by the model because it's very high resolution. Okay. So this is a an example of what the model can do. Let's see if uh, the full screen. Okay, so that's that's Manhattan. Okay, that's New York, and and in yellow or gold, that's Manhattan. And this square is a 0.1 by 0.1 degree ocean grid cell in this model. Okay, so one tenth of a degree times one tenth of a degree, which is basically similar to Manhattan. Okay, so what this, what this means is that whatever is bigger than Manhattan is resolved by the model, whatever is smaller than Manhattan or that size is not resolved by the model. Okay, whatever, the, and, and those are called sub-grid scale um, processes. Okay? So whatever is smaller than the grid cell, I cannot resolve it because I don't have enough numerical grid points to resolve, to resolve that process. So those processes have to be parameterized. But whatever is bigger than Manhattan or, or 15 times 15 kilometers is probably resolved by the model. Okay? Well, that's a way of saying because you know, to resolve something, you need at least two or three grid points. That's just to give you an idea. And so this is what the model. So you take a bunch of those grid cells and you cover your, you cover the ocean with those one tenth times one tenth grid cells, and in every grid cells, you compute momentum, mass, energy, trace equations. And, so on and, so on. and then you communicate all the grid cells and you end up with this beautiful realization of what the uh, <coughs> ocean circulation is. So this is temperature, red is warm and blue and white is cold. So you see the Gulf Stream, you know what the Gulf Stream is? The Gulf Stream is this warm current that goes from 
from the tropics northwards and then crosses the Atlantic. And then you see all this cold and sea ice coming down from the Arctic Ocean and, and intruding into, the, into Canada. Here we are in the uh, Equatorial Pacific. So this is the equator. And you see these nice waves. So maybe in a second you'll see. You see an El Nino. You see how cold this is. This is an El Nino event. And you see these nice waves propagating across the equator. Those are Kelvin waves propagating. Tropical instability waves, sorry. And you see all these different filaments and eddies and instabilities that tend to mix traces and momentum and they and they change so it's something that happens at the local scale but all those instabilities and, and mixing processes they act at the local scale but they change the large scale flow as well this is the Pacific and you see the equivalent of the equivalent of the Gulf Stream is called the uh, Kuroshio current it's this warm current flowing north and then crossing the Pacific and this is Is the black uh, stripe uh, the polar front? Black, um, this one? Yes. Could be. Yep. Here you have another one. Not here. This is the. Um, so you see, this is called the Agulas current, which is flowing south, then is entering the uh, Antarctic Ocean, and is retroflecting, and is going into the Antarctic Circumpolar current. But as it's doing so, it's getting unstable and is detaching rings, and these rings they travel into the Atlantic. You see, all these rings detaching from the instability and flowing into the Atlantic and as they do so they transport salt and temperature into the Atlantic Ocean. This is the equatorial Atlantic, you see how warm it is here. In summer you have something like an Atlantic El Nino here as well. And you have all this warm water that is going into the Caribbean and then eventually making its way into the Gulf Stream. So it's just a, a nice movie to show you that this is what we do with this kind of equation. And um, you can use simpler model to do many things. Okay, So you can use simplified equations to make what we call toy models. Okay, So you can simplify things a lot. You, you will simplify equations a lot in the second part, in the geophysical uh, part of this course when you will, you know, you take the momentum equation, you make approximations, and you arrive to a subset of the equations. For example, the quasi-geostrophic equation. In the quasi-geostrophic equation, they say, okay, well, the main balance between the forces is this and that. And so I can, I can get some physical understanding of the system with a simplified set of equation. And you can actually integrate this equation, or solve them analytically, and you can get a sense of, <coughs> of the physical picture. Okay, so that's, that's also useful. But if you take the full equations, and if you take the full knowledge, then you can get to uh, nice models like that, which are the models that are used to make you know, projections of future possible future climates or paleoclimates, or just understanding the variability of the climate system and the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. Was that a question? Or? No. No? <laughs> I uh, will show the. Uh, this was a video. The video, especially uh, down at the, uh, the Cape uh, uh, in South Africa. Mm. Is, is temperature the, the chief reason as to why, if you're at the Cape, you can see the difference between the Indian and the other side of the ocean? They don't tend, they don't tend to meet up.
between here and here. So what is happening is it, that's a very complicated system. So you have South Africa, okay, and you have the uh, Agulas current, which is flowing like this. Okay, and the Agulas current is flowing south along the coast, and it's very warm and it's very salty. Okay, and it's taking warm and salty Indian Ocean along the coast of South Africa. Then you have Antarctic, the Antarctic coast here. Okay. And you have a very strong current that is flowing like this. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Okay. And it's flowing like that. So what is happening is that the Agulas current hits the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and it goes into the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Okay? And you can see it in the, uh, in the movie, you can see sometimes how, how it does that. When it's doing this, it's becoming unstable okay? and it breaks into different branches and it actually sheds some eddies, some circular patterns. that you can see. Maybe. Okay, you see the Agulas current and then is retroflected into the ACC. And as it's doing that, it's becoming unstable and it's breaking into many eddies. And those eddies, you see one yellow there? This. And then uh, another one. Uh. And all these eddies, they start traveling into the Atlantic Ocean. And they bring warm and salty water into the Atlantic Ocean. So that's one way to mix Indian Ocean waters with Atlantic Ocean waters. And actually all these eddies, they um, eventually they dissipate and they mix, but they can travel very long distance and actually they reach the Brazilian coast and the uh, equatorial Atlantic. And so they actually change the mean circulation and the mean structure of the Atlantic Ocean by bringing this warm and salty Indian Ocean water particles into the Atlantic Ocean. So the, uh, the Indian Ocean Atlantic Ocean, they don't mix here and here. They don't mix like this. But some of the Indian Ocean water <coughs> gets into the Atlantic Ocean by this instability mechanism. And then you have then you have something even more complicated that you have. You see all this blue water here? This is an upwelling system. Upwelling means cold water coming up from below. Okay? We'll see that in the ocean dynamics course. So there's actually cold water surfacing from the subsurface that's cold and it reaches the surface. And so that's why you see you see all that cold water along the coast of Namibia. Okay? And that's why you have a lot of fisheries there, because cold water means water rich in nutrients, and water need, water need rich in nutrients means a lot of fish. Okay, so wherever you have an upwelling system, you usually have a lot of fisheries and fish. And that upwelling system is also has a seasonality, so that it's not stable all year round. And that seasonality is also affected by this eddies getting into the Atlantic Ocean. So there's a lot of interaction between different circulations. My question is about the ACC, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Does the Warm water from the Agulas current warms this uh, ACC and, and in effect warms the Antarctic? No. 
No, because it's, it's much it's much smaller than the ACC itself. Okay. So this is this is a little bit of so this is a relatively small current and this is a huge current. This goes around Antarctica. It's one of the fastest and strongest currents. It carries a lot of a lot of water. <coughs> and actually, this ACC that goes around Antarctica acts like a barrier between the subtropical oceans and Antarctica. Okay, so an Antarctic waters here in the whole climate of Antarctica is particularly cold and has the condition that it has because there's this ACC flowing around that is like a barrier that doesn't allow warm water to get close to the coast. So because of this ACC, which is particularly strong, it's like a wall that doesn't allow warm water to penetrate into into the near the coast. Okay. Or, or at least not as much as it would without the ACC. Are these currents uh, averages over the wall uh, of other columns or near the surface? This is sea surface temperature. This is sea surface temperature uh, daily. No, I mean the, the behavior, like the currents mixing or eddies. Well, you're, 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 you're seeing the eddies and the Agulas current through the temperature. Okay. And so this, sea surface, this is just sea surface temperature. And uh, it's probably daily or twice daily or something like that. Uh, we could have plotted the velocity vector. So this pattern is not reproduced at uh, greater depth. As the uh, 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 up to a certain point, yes. So these eddies are barotropic, so they go down to 800 meters or 600 meters. So they are pretty, pretty thick, and they are they are barotropic eddies, and they maintain their rotation and, and, and uh, traces basically all the way they cross the Atlantic here and they most of them they make it to the uh, American coast so you could see uh, you could see these eddies and the Agulas current if you would look at the velocity vector at 100 or 200 meters And what is the driving force for the Antarctic currents, for the current circulating current? The winds. Okay. Most of it is the winds. So you have the westerlies flowing in this direction. So you have, so it's basically forced by the winds, but it's also buoyancy. It's also buoyancy forced. So heat and cooling, they create a pressure gradient and that pressure gradient through something that we will see the thermal wind it's called wind because it is a theory that comes from the atmospheric uh, physics so we use thermal winds in the ocean as well it should be thermal current so because of buoyancy because of a buoyancy gradient at the surface you generate a pressure gradient and that gives you a circulation as well. So this ACC is driven, it's not so clear how much is driven by the winds and how much is driven by the uh, buoyancy forces on the surface, but both of them are important. The winds here are probably the strongest in the world, particularly because there is no land barrier. So the wind and the current, they could go around Antarctica without hitting any continent. So if you look at the winds, if you look at a map of the surface winds or wind stress in the, uh, in the Earth, the largest wind stress is over, the, uh, is over this um, band around the Antarctica. In the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, North Pacific, you have similar winds, <coughs> but then you have the continents. So they cannot drive uh, as much in the currents in the ocean. 
and then the uh, you might think so if the wind is driving constantly without hitting any continent and the ACC is going around Antarctica again and again so why doesn't it keep accelerating forever well there's bottom drag bottom drag is the uh, dissipation of energy and how do you connect the wind stress with the bottom drag is through the eddies okay, so eddies they transfer momentum vertically and then eventually they dissipate momentum through bottom drag that's why having a high resolution model like that one is very useful because you you properly simulate the eddies effects and if you properly have you simulate the eddies effect the eddies are resolved and they do their job energetically in transferring momentum vertically to the bottom and dissipating momentum. If instead you have a lower resolution model, you have to parameterize the eddy effects. And so you might not parameterize the eddy effects properly or fully. And so the way they transfer the momentum vertically or the way they transfer the momentum across the ACC, these eddy fluxes, might not be as good as when you resolve them. So having a model like this has many advantages because you are properly resolving all the effects. The problem is that it's very expensive to run. So, so if we didn't have eddies, it could be just a band of uh, surface temperature in, in the only latitude varying. If we didn't have any eddies, Yes, or the smaller one. I mean, no. I mean is there is that a big effect that they uh, <coughs> the presence of eddies yeah. is huge locally and on the large scale. So the total transport of the ACC uh, if you're not properly resolving eddies, even the timing transport can change by twenty five percent because of the eddies effects on transferring momentum, dissipating momentum and the way you are fluxing heat and salt across the ACC also depends on the eddies so if you have properly the eddies or not then you might flux more or less heat across the ACC you might melt more or less sea ice that will change your ocean circulation and so on and so forth so properly resolving it, and, and the problem of this, the problem of this is that, so the uh, the uh, the eddies depend on the latitude, and at the equator they are relatively big, and as you move towards the poles they they become smaller and smaller, okay? because they depend on something that is called the Rossby radius. So the Rossby radius becomes smaller and smaller at the poles, and the eddies because they are balanced circulation, they have to be within the radius of, of the Rossby radius. Okay. So if you look at the, uh, if you remember at the, at, in the equatorial Pacific, you had those large tropical instability waves that were like this. Okay. And so these circulations were pretty large. If you look at the eddies near the uh, Antarctic circumpolar currents, they are very small. They are six to eight kilometers roughly okay they're pretty pretty small and so you need to resolve them properly so that's why you need a model like this and even a model like this barely resolves the eddies at those latitudes so so you need to you need to have you need to have a good representation of the eddy fluxes at this latitude because they're important locally but whatever happens here over the Antarctica, it changes the global ocean circulation as well. It's something that we will see. Okay. So here there is water mass formation. There is <coughs> there's a lot of water. There is upwelling from the uh, subsurface and some other water becoming dense and sinking to the bottom, and then it's traveling all over the world. So it's a very sensitive region. So if you're not resolving properly all the small local effects you will mess up the global situation. Okay. That's another problem of, of doing ocean modeling versus atmospheric modeling, is that if you do atmospheric modeling, you run your model for 
one or two years, and then the atmosphere has equilibrated. And you see if your atmospheric model is good or not. You run two years of model integration, you might spend a day, you look at the results, say, okay, this is good, this is not good, I need to increase this parameter, or I need to do this. If you're doing ocean modeling, you prepare your model, you know, you do your parameterizations, you do everything, and then you start running your model. And your model equilibrates after 6,000, 8,000 years. So you run, you know, because it's, it's a diffusive time scale in the ocean. Okay? And so you start running your model, and after 500 years, the surface circulation is, is quasi equilibrated. You say, okay, no, actually, this is fine. This is good, it's going okay. But then you're, you're not properly resolving eddies here or the bottom water formation here. And so slowly the bottom water formation here stops, and that doesn't feed the bottom circulation in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, which eventually slowly fills up the Pacific or the Atlantic and changes the surface circulation as well. And so after 6,000 years, you realize that your model has drifted to a huge problem. And it's taking you two months. <laughs> and you have to go back and start again. So, and that's because the, uh, the, uh, the ocean is, is more sensitive to local effects than the atmosphere. So in the, uh, for example, in the North Atlantic, there's water sinking to the bottom, and that's part of the uh, thermohaline circulation, or the global meridional laboratory circulation. And another region where water sinks to the bottom is, is close to the Antarctic coast as well. So here there's two or three places where water gets very dense and sinks to the bottom. And also in the North Atlantic, water gets very dense and sinks to the bottom. And that creates something like a cell of buoyancy-driven circulation. In the atmosphere, it's more distributed. Whereas in the ocean, there's like four or five spots where this is happening. So you might have all your ocean circulation properly resolved, but if you have something wrong in this spot, because there's too much sea ice or less sea ice, or the winds are not in the right position, or whatever, after two or three thousand years, your water mass um, generation in this place might stop. And after two more thousand years, the global ocean circulation will change because of this. Okay? Just because you're not doing a good job in this small place. <coughs> do you think it can be downloaded? This, uh, the this is on YouTube. Yes, I mean the output files of the model. No. Absolutely. I have them. <laughs> but they're not public. They're not public. the second part of the uh, of the course which is introducing rotation and the effects of a uh, rotating frame of reference and then the same equation will have an extra term which is due to the rotation of the earth and a few things will arise that are proper to not just fluid dynamics but geophysical fluid dynamics. Yeah. 
is, 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 is the linear system no? because, for example, you show that if, if, if the flow is due to the imbalance between temperatures on the eastern coast, the temperatures are really high along the equator, so it flows towards the south. But on the western side, the, the flow or the eddies you talk about flow from from from, the, from, uh, from South Africa, which is called uh, towards the equator. And then if it is due to the effect of wind, the monsoon and the season that flow towards the East African coast, that probably will drive the water down along the coast of South Africa. The rainy season, the storm will not happen across the coast. So, is, is the video rainy season or is yes. the year the equilibrium? No, the video was a uh, daily snapshot. You, you could see, you could see the um, the calendar. But we were probably looking at it. That's the uh, summer in the Indian Ocean. That's the summer current that changes direction seasonally because of the monsoon circulation. But that's not the Agulas. It's not the same as the So this is July 30. So what you're talking about is the uh, the summer current here, which reverses the circulation because of the monsoon. But not, but not the so what, what is the driving factor for this one? The Agulis, I, I think, I think it's winds as well, but it's not the monsoon winds, which are far that. So this is the wind. Yeah. So the summer the summer current reverses sign, but the Agulis current, which is this one. I, 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 know, like, I, I guess it changes seasonally the strength, but it doesn't reverse the situation. Uh, if, if, for example, you stand here, here at the cap, mm -hmm. you look, the other side is going to be dark and the side, that side is light. What is that? The water is really clear on one side. Is that true? I mean, yes. think people tell me that. Is that true? Yes. If you're like, okay, you really see this water is really dark and this is really light. Yes. That be the. That's because so they, 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 they don't mix much. Right? They, they don't mix much. So this is very warm and very salty. And it, it, because if it's very salty, then the uh, solar penetration is different. And so the color of the water is different than if you are less salty. So the difference in color might be due to the concentration of salt. Or simply I, I don't know locally the situation, but also you know, if, if it's very, uh, if there's a lot of mixing going on, it might be more dark just because of the mixing. Whereas on the other side, there might be less mixing. So there might be more penetration. <laughs> But I, I suspect it will cause the tea, right? Yeah. 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 This one does not mix with this. Yeah. 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 And then it gets which of the energies. As it does this, it breaks, it gets a stable and it breaks. And it generates many eddies. These eddies they don't mix at the beginning. So so you, you can see you can see these eddies traveling for days, maybe weeks. And they conserve their temperature and salinity. And then eventually they mix into the Atlantic. But for a few days you, you can see them traveling into the Atlantic Ocean without mixing them. <coughs> But then eventually they mix, and so they transport all the temperature and salinity into the Atlantic Ocean. So eventually they they, they dissipate and mix. But it takes, it takes a while. So there's not much mixing, and that's why if you go to the cave, you clearly see two different waters. I have a question. There, there is uh, a lake in Ethiopia, and uh, it's uh, around the source of Blue Nile. So uh, there is a place where the, the river crosses over the lake, 
but they don't mix and you can see the, the river crossing over the lake without mixing. What could be the reason for this? The, the, the river crosses over the lake, over the lake, and it can pass through without mixing. It. It's magic. When when the river crosses. Yes, passes three does not mix. There's no mix. mix. Yes. You can see the, the color difference between the lake and the river, and it can pass through over the lake. Well, you probably see a plume, maybe. For example, if you if you look if you look at the Gulf here, um, after a heavy rain, <coughs> there's a lot of there is a lot of water that gets into the uh, into the sea from small rivers. So you can clearly see if from town, let's say, or even from here, you look at the Gulf, you see a front of relatively darker water traveling uh, from east to west. So uh, this is the Gulf, this is town, and we are here. Okay. So after two or three days of heavy rain, there's plenty of small rivers that take the water from, from the mountains into the, into the Gulf. Okay? So after a few days of, of heavy rain, you can clearly see the water in the Gulf divided in two, where this is relatively clear and this is dark. And, and if you look at this front, it moves. Because this is all the rivers that, that take the um, all the water from, from the rivers, which is you know, full of a lot of stuff from, from, from the earth. Okay. So you can see, so it seems like they're not mixing, just because you know, that's probably, it, it's also lighter because it's not, you know, this, this is seawater and the other one is fresh water, so it stays at the surface. Uh, so it stays at the surface and it doesn't mix much. But a lake and a river, there's no difference. Well, maybe maybe the lake is maybe the lake is particularly cold, and the river is particularly warm. Maybe on the material content between the water and the lake, they are different. I think the what? The, the river carries some sediments with it. So the lake is uh, clean, relatively clean. Yeah. So there may be a difference in buoyancy. Basically. A bit different in, in buoyancy, and so there is, uh, the water carried by the river stays at the surface and it doesn't mix. Yeah. But how it crosses the... Uh, uh, there is a line that you can so see distinctly. <laughs> but you probably, you probably see... So if this is if this is your lake, you probably see if this is your river, you probably see something like this. It's not like that. Can I draw it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The river know the exit. Yeah, it's, uh, it has a natural uh, uh, drainage system. So I don't know. Uh, so why 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 is the river not going like this? I have no idea. 
that it gets into the lake and get out of some kind out of the lake. That's something. Maybe the, 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 the river created the lake uh, at some point no, in time. No, I don't know. There are no interaction. Uh, this is a uh, crater lake, mm -hmm. and this is a uh, river Blue Nile, which is uh, sourced from some somewhere else, mm -hmm. and they cross over, and this one will continue. This journey. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a. Huh? Ethiopian magic. <laughs> Maybe there's some topographic constraint. Maybe. So this is not happening. So maybe if you cross here from A to B, and you look from A to B, maybe. shallow and here is very deep and then it's shallow again and so the river is constrained to follow the bathymetry of the lake perhaps and and the more it flows maybe the more it creates its own bed I don't know there must be a reason for going always towards the right door <laughs> It passes in the middle of the lake, but when you stand on at high altitude, you also see so going through the middle of the lake. Okay, so that's what that, that's happening in Ethiopia. Yeah, you also and see the green the lake, but there is a distinct uh, color difference between the river and the lake. Seems that they are not mixing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, but uh, but uh, Victoria is a freshwater lake. And even yeah. Chobe is a freshwater lake. Yeah, so the lake in Ethiopia is fresh freshwater. Fresh well, the, the, the difference, buoyancy doesn't doesn't make them mixing, but the fact that it's following one yeah. particular path has to be some geometrical constraint on the uh, on the floor. Otherwise, I mean, if, 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 they don't, if they don't mix, it would just spread. Without mixing, it would just spread.